And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, the 2021 Desperado LGBTQ Film Festival. Uh, you uh, have just watched uh, or will watch Potato Dreams of America. Uh, and I'm joined today by uh, the film's director and writer, Wes Hurley. Uh, Wes, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, we're excited to have you uh, uh, here to chat about your film. Uh, I first want to congratulate you. It's an absolutely wonderful film. Um, I really enjoyed the characters. I enjoyed the story. And I think what caught me by surprise in a good way was that it was based on a true story. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the genesis of the story? What, um, what encouraged you to tell this story at this point in your career and in your life? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me and having the film and the festival. Um, I, uh, you know, this film is 99%, I like to say, autobiographical. It's very, very faithful to my childhood. And um, I initially wrote it about eight years ago. There was a huge controversy going on with uh, Olympics going on in Sochi in Russia and how the world should respond to, you know, uh, Putin's anti-gay policies and so on. And um, I kind of got sucked into that conversation and decided to tell my story because it directly relates to that. And um, it was a struggle to get, you know, something made that's, independent gay set in Russia micro budget so it take me you know it's taken me eight years to get here and in between I ended up making a, a short documentary little potato which tells the same story but um, you know is a doc it's just like a talking head doc with me and my mom telling our story and it did really well um, I made it hoping that it will help to get the feature made and as sometimes happens you know with shorts you use it as sort of a leverage to get the feature made and it helped a lot okay. um and i made a short vr piece that also um showed at south by southwest that basically also told the story but was more conceptual and surreal and was also sort of a way for me to show that concept of like a highly stylized world of Soviet Union, even though the story is very um, biographical and true. I, uh, I felt a, a raw intensity and honesty that came through uh, the, uh, the character of Potato. Uh, how did you happen to come or select uh, the actors who ultimately portrayed Potato? Because we have the younger potato when he was a child still in Russia. And we have the teenage potato as he begins to explore his sexuality and uh, explore life outside of, of Russia. Yeah, um, both uh, Hirsch Powers, the younger potato, and Tyler Bocock, the older potato, are Seattle-based actors. Um, I started, it was actually funny, I, I started casting... Um, little potato before we even had the budget the money to to make the film and my thinking was you know i've never worked with kids before and i was really intimidated by you know finding the right kid and i thought okay it's going to take us years because <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know even bigger budget films sometimes you see really bad child actors and i was just like it's going to be so hard um and i had a very surprising experience where you know the kids showed up and i was just so impressed with them there were so many talented kids but Hirsch really stood out he was you know in addition to being really talented and sort of intuitive and strangely mature for his age you know he was I think 13 when we auditioned him and um, he was also like he just had that kind of glow on camera that like movie stars have and I was like who is this kid so we literally as soon as we found him we we're like we have to make this right away before he <laughs> before he grows up so it was like a huge kick in the butt for me and my co-producer misha uh, to you know raise the money um so I, I thank hirsch all the time for that and then tyler um you know i wasn't as intimidated by finding you know a younger man actor but it was definitely it was a chat you know i i thought it was going to be really challenging uh, he has to do a Russian accent, but Tyler was just 
beautiful. Like he, his addition was amazing. He came in, he, he's never done accents, but his Russian accent even to start with was pretty good. So I knew that if we hire, um, you know, a voice coach, he could be really excellent. And he was, um, and again, he had this sort of charming quality on camera. Um, I think, it, you know, the challenge for me or something I was worried about for the American half is that, um, you know, this sort of archetype of a brooding, angsty teenager, which I was in real life, um, it can be really obnoxious to watch. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's like we can all relate to that because I think most of us have been there, but like watching it is not necessarily fun. It's like irritating. So I wanted to find somebody who can have that angst and brooding, but also has sort of innate likability and yeah. you're drawn to them. And I feel like Tyler had that. And so I was really excited when we found them. That's awesome. Uh, I, um, I have the feeling, and I don't know if my feeling is, is accurate or not, that uh, part of what informed uh, the teenage version of Potato was the fact that he was a fish out of water, both because yeah. he was uh, in America and he didn't have experience here, but also because he hadn't come out of the closet. And uh, I thought that, that uh, the, the intimidation that you felt as a director and when you were casting makes sense because uh, that added a gravitas to the American side of, of this production that I, I thought really uh, added a layer of, of emotion that I wasn't expecting, but I really appreciated. It was honest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I, I just have to say, you know, this is my first time working with younger actors and I was really, it just surprises me because I'm used to working with, all, you know, older actors and you just don't ex like, I don't know where they get that depth, you know what I mean? Cause they don't have the life experiences, but I guess some actors just have that kind of intuitive sort of thing where they can go there even though they haven't really been there personally you know right um uh the actress who played the your uh your mother uh and forgive me um uh was it um there's two as well so the yes Sarah Barbieri plays her yep. in Russia and Mariah Sikaminsky plays her in America. Thank you. I apologize. Oh, um, no, no, fine. Um, both actresses, uh, there was a cavalier. I, I, I intuitively picked up a cavalier attitude from both versions of uh, the, the, uh, the, the mom character. And um, uh, it wasn't out of spite. It was out of necessity. I think it was a protection mechanism mm -hmm. um, because uh, you don't want to angst the machine on the Russian side and you don't want to angst the machine on the American side once you're here because there's a, a level of security that you're here now um, and you don't necessarily have to go back. And uh, I thought that both actresses did a wonderful job of conveying that that no nonsense attitude. If if you'll forgive my expression, um, what was your casting uh, experience like with those actresses, and uh, did the character or your intention with the character change from the script to what we see on the screen? Yeah, so um, so Mariah Sikaminsky, who plays American Lena, she was actually a big impetus for me to make the film. She's somebody I've known for a really long time. She was a Seattle actor, director um, that I really admired. And I saw, so I, I kind of wrote the script as a vehicle for her. Uh, she since then like moved to Pittsburgh and she's uh, in charge of P P Pittsburgh Public Theater there and wow. busy, but she made time to, um, you know, to come out and do this film. But so she was sort of my muse for that role. You know, I mean, of course, my mom is my muse for the role, but, you right. know, as far as performers. Um, and Sarah uh, Barbieri, the younger version, um, she was again, you know, she's not much older than Tyler, who plays me, <laughs> the older version of me. 
you know, she's to me, to me, you know, I'm 40. She's, so she's like a kid to me. And um, again, I was really in additions. I was really surprised by her depth. Uh, I just, I love her. Like she has those eyes that are like super expressive. Yes. And I'm, like mesmerized by that. Um, you know, we talked a lot. She's read a lot about like Russian women and that era in the Soviet Union. And so she did her research. Um, but in terms of tone, it hasn't really changed. I mean, I was really clear about the tone of it to the actors when we started, and I think they conveyed it pretty well. You know, one of the things was like the really dramatic change between the characters when they come to the States, because I really wanted to convey this, you know, abrupt sort of alienating, um, I mean, in this case, not necessarily bad, but like, just the culture shock of coming over as an immigrant, I think anywhere, it doesn't matter if you're coming to America or anywhere, it's just, you know, if you don't speak the language really well, it really feels like you're on a different planet. You know, everything is so different. Culture is different, everything looks different, people are different. Um, and so was, when we came to the States, we really did become different people. I mean, it felt like we were completely different people, you know, uh, and my mom changed from this really stoic sort of guarded, um, like sharp-witted woman into almost a childlike kind of giggly creature, <laughs> but still really, you know, still very sharp. But she had, I, like you said, it was also a defense mechanism against my stepfather because he was so uh, volatile that she had to play up the sort of innocence yeah. uh, because that way she could try to subdue, you know, his mood swings. Uh, but it was so interesting for me to watch because I, you know, we were so close and, I, you know, I, to just see this adult completely become a different human, you know, it, so that's another reason why I wanted to change actresses too, is just to really drive that home. I, uh, I confess that um, as I watch the movie, you that transition is so very smooth. You don't really, I didn't really notice a change in the actor uh, who played hey. your mom. And uh, I thought that was really impressive because the facial features, the eyes, right? The eyes, uh, they, they're wide, they emote, they have experience and knowledge and that doesn't change throughout your film. And I thought that that was really impressive. That's awesome, thank you. Um, you're welcome. Um, editing wise, uh, did you, um, did you film all of your scenes in sequence or did you have to shoot sequences out of order? And did that impact um, uh, your flow of uh, your flow of uh, your flow of storytelling and maybe how you aligned your actors in terms of what scenes you were shooting when? We, you know, we shot it in out of order uh, in many different ways. So first of all, we shot American scenes first in the fall, and then we raised the rest of the money and shot um, Russian scenes in the winter. So out of order in that way, and also out of order within those two worlds. Um, I have a wonderful collaborator, Sarah Crow, who was my AD. And so she worked really hard to try to keep it as linear as possible because it's always helpful for the actors. But uh, but I think, you know, we're we're pretty much most of the time, I mean, most of us I think are used to shooting stuff out of order because in the film, it's just, it's very hard to make it, um, you know, to really make it linear like in theater, even though it's ideal for actors, it's just in terms of your budgetary and logistical things, it's, it, it's usually impossible, so. You know, it was as out of order as it gets, I would say, <laughs> just for logistical reasons, you know. Sure, sure. Um, your editor did an excellent job. I, I, as I said, I thought the the transition was seamless between uh, the the Russian scenes and the American scenes, and you don't you don't detect that. Was there anything that you shot that you left on the floor or out of the picture? Thank you. Um, I edited, so I'm very flattered. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have money for an editor. So. Bravo. <laughs> but um, I plan, uh, I usually plan my things really 
precisely because I do have to edit stuff myself. Um, so I generally know exactly what goes where. Like I don't improvise in the editing room at all. It's it's all pre-planned. There's always things that get, you know, trimmed down a little bit. So what I, you know, I don't think I cut out any of the scenes, but I definitely cut down some of the dialogue and some of the scenes where it sometimes you don't know until you see actors do it that it's like okay this actually doesn't need to go on right for that long but for the most part it's all how I envisioned in the first place uh excellent um as you were getting your shots your dailies uh did you find that you needed to do multiple takes or did you have your scene list set up in a way that you could do all of your scenes in one take or, or one or two takes and um, I imagine that if you get multiple takes, you have the option of selecting the better angle in which to convey your story um, or uh, yeah. the inflection or the intuition of an actor may be different in one take versus another. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I always try to do a few takes. I mean, it doesn't, I don't feel like it needs to be a, a many takes, but just for safety it's good to have you know at least more than one um in terms of you know a lot of it comes down again to like logistics of shooting so i try to you know on, on days where it's like we have so little time and so much to do i really try to think through of like like what kind of composition is the simplest in terms of you know if we just set up two cameras we have two cameras which is really helpful um you know as opposed to you know having a bunch of different cuts and angles yeah. uh, so um but yeah I, just, I think it really varied from scene to scene and like what the actors were doing um i i know some some shots we only did like two takes and some shots i've had like you know 10 maybe takes <laughs> <laughs> Uh, really dependent on the scene and what we're trying to do and if things were going wrong because sometimes a lot of things that you know have nothing to do with actors but just technically things just go wrong and you, sure. keep, you keep trying gotcha uh the life of a director and and life on a set right <laughs> yeah um i want to circle back to the remainder of the cast and uh, Leah Delaria uh, is a gem in this movie. Um, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about what it was working like, what it was like working with her and uh, how she, um, uh, uh, how her presence increased the happiness on the set or the productivity or uh, did it influence the production in any way beyond you're already uh, effervescent view on your own life story. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I wrote, when I wrote the script, my dream um, grandma would be uh, Leah. And so uh, we were thrilled when she said yes. And, and of course, it felt like she elevated, you know, the whole set because every, you know, we all know her work. It was just really such an honor to have her own and everybody was excited. And she was very lovely she just you know she asked me first day it's like you know I'll give you exactly what you want where you know she, we had a long conversation about what the character is and we were on the same page um and then when my mom re in real life you know when she saw the movie she's like I don't know how she did it but she really captured you know because she's never met my grandma but she really captured her um you know and she's just so funny and fun and she really you know, she mentored Hirsch a lot because it's his first feature film you know he's a he's a kid and she she just gave him a lot of professional kind of shop talk and advice and things that I know he's really he was really excited to get That's from pro um and I think what the funniest um Leah's story for me is, you know, there's like a really, really little potato in the very first opening scene of the film was like a toddler. Yeah. And the first time we, we wanted to introduce him to his grandma um, right away to give him time to get used to her. And he literally ran his arm. <laughs> 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 
But then the parents told him that she was the character on Cars 3. Oh. And she was in love ever since. And so when she, at one point, she left, like she was done with the scene and we were still working with him. And he started crying. He was like, where's my fake grandma? <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious that was so cute yeah so cute um uh i i thought that she she played the character very stoically and very statically um there was there was black and white right and wrong there was no real emotion coming from her and i found that very funny in an ironic sort of way. And uh, it, it just impressed me because you have an emoting grandson and you have a somewhat emoting um, uh, mother and the, the talk about uh, the, all the women in uh, uh, their lives lose their husbands. And, uh, um, you know, it was, it was, deadpan humor that um, I really appreciated and it, it 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 elevated the production and it elevated the movie because uh, as an audience I get I got the sense that um, I didn't I didn't need to fear Russia in 1985 mm -hmm. there was room for emotion uh, it wasn't it wasn't out there like we, like Americans are. Uh, we don't, you, you, you didn't express yourselves back then the way you might today. Uh, and it's more of a culture thing than anything else. And um, it just, it really impressed me. Uh, did you give um, uh, Leah that stage direction or did she come up with that on her own? Yeah, it's something we discussed with her and she, you know, when we, she read the script and we talked about the script and we were both on the same page. So, you know, when we talked through it, it was like, she knew exactly what I was going for in the script. Um, so it was really helpful. I don't even remember really any point where I had to say like, oh, this, you have to do it differently because we were we had this exa same exact idea of what this needs to be and who, who she is and yeah uh i i thought i thought it was really awesome um the other thing that struck me uh was and and i i don't know if this was intentional or if it was realistic to your experience as a child uh but i felt a wes anderson vibe out of the Russian side of the movie. Uh, and it almost plays like uh, Taika Waititi's Jojo Rabbit, where mm. Potato is talking to Jesus Christ, not literally there, but just, uh, I got the sense uh, that it, it was um, in his imagination. And um, I thought that was brilliant. And um, I, you, you worked on this for eight, eight years prior to uh, it being presented to audiences. Did, was, was that your intent when you wrote the script? And was that true to, uh, accurate to your experience as a child? Or um, was it more for, more of a fictionalization of your experience? No, it's a very, I mean, all of the events and conversations are very faithful to my childhood. Um, you know, I remember seeing Jojo Rabbit in theaters and being just really frustrated because it's like I knew that people would think about it. Right. Um, but I was like, well, I I've written it years before the movie got made, but it's like there's nothing you can do. Um, yeah, and I've always I'm not I, I can't say that I'm influenced by Wes Anderson, but I loved um I remember discovering Fassbender as a young person and I didn't necessarily love his films, but I loved the style. I loved the flat compositions. Mm -hmm. I love in uh, Bitter Tears of, I don't remember the full title, but there's like a sequence at the very end where it's just everything kind of happens like on stage and people yeah. are walking through. And I was just like, 
for some reason that really, really resonated with me. And I, I was like, ah, I, I just love that style. So I think that influenced me quite a bit. Um, and it's both aesthetically pleasing for me as an audience members and also as a as a like a super low budget filmmaker, I you know, I want everything to be really precise in terms of production design. And it's very challenging to create a three-dimensional set like that. So I, you know, when you, if, if it's flatter, um, that allows me to be really, really deliberate in the set design. Um, but then I, I don't have to create a whole house or a whole, <laughs> right. whole space. So it, it's also, you know, it's both, uh, you know, creative and a logistical thing as well. Sure. I, my hat's off to you. I, I thought it worked wonderfully. And, um, uh, you know, I, I like it when um, uh, directors uh, such as yourself uh, have to work within their framework. I don't, I don't necessarily like it that you have to work in that type of a framework, but you recognize that your budget only allows for so much and it forces you to become uh, more creative than I think even you were uh, aware of going in, uh, aware of before you went into production. And I, again, my hat's off to you. I thought it was really an impressive look and it really sets off the, the bright sunny skies of Seattle in the second half of the movie, which leads me into the Mandy character. Um, uh, I got the sense that uh, unintentionally Mandy was amused to potato. Um, even though they weren't dating in any way, shape, or form, he hadn't confronted his own sexuality yet, or, or he, he knew about it, but he hadn't confronted it. And uh, uh, I thought that the scene in the park where um, Mandy, Mandy is doing the uh, face drawing of Potato was really impressive. It was really heartfelt. Um, I got a lot out of that moment. I, I got a lot of uh, a lot out of many moments in your film, uh, but that one in particular really struck me because um, you, if if you were a traditional film, you might expect them to have that happy ending right then and there, something that your movie reflects on, and instead it's bang, we're done. I'm never going to see you again, and she walks off the movie. And uh, I think that that was an impetus for the remainder of the movie for uh, Potato to finally face his fears and be able to come to grips with who he was and be able to explore it, um, which leads to another wonderful part of the movie. But uh, how did Mandy come about and um, uh, is she a muse or is she a, pardon the expression, a flavor of the day and we move on from her? Uh, I mean, Mandy is based on a real person, like everybody in the film is yeah. based very closely on the real person. So uh, Mandy is based on a friend that I had that I thought she was a friend. She thought we were dating. <laughs> and it, it, you're right about it being an impetus in the sense that, you know, it made me, um, when I had that conversation with her and she was frustrated and crying, you know, and I, it made me so angry that I couldn't be out uh, because even though I never, I don't feel like I deliberately misled her, I never said we're dating or I never, but I can see how she was confused and it just made me so angry that it's like, okay, I'm, I do not want to lie to people but I couldn't be honest because of my stepfather. So, um, you know, and then the film, like in real life, you know, then you transition to the scene where he's like angry listening to Marilyn Manson and finally comes out to his mom, which, you know, which was what happened basically. It was. It reminded me of uh, my coming out to my mom and, and she's like, I knew. <laughs> Why the big secret? Well, uh, I'm afraid of myself, not the rest of the world. So <laughs> it's kind of hard for me to tell you. And uh, I, I, again, just a, a beautiful moment in the movie. Um, uh, I, I'm glad you shared that experience with us because um, even as painful as it must have been, as frustrating as it was, 
uh, it led us to Dan Loria's character. And uh, when I was a kid, uh, the original um, uh, Wonder Years was on TV. And I remember Dan being very, even though it was Ben Savage's show, um, it, uh, um, uh, I got the wrong Savage, didn't I? Doesn't matter. Um, Fred. 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 Fred Savage. Thank you. Uh, okay. I them too. <laughs> <laughs> Fred's show, Dan Loria always stood out to me because uh, even though he was uh, a quiet individual in that show, um, he was, uh, you always felt his presence on the screen. And here, um, he starts out very boisterous, very Republican, very conservative. Um, and, uh, the world is out to get me. And I felt like that was a defense mechanism for Grace, uh, who totally surprises us, by the way. I, I really love that, uh, uh, that that comes for me out of nowhere, uh, because, um, uh, you don't expect it. You, somewhere in the back of your mind, you want it because there's a connection between, um, uh, Dan's character and Potato, and uh, that I, I um, uh, that plays out. There's a tension there, and you really need an icebreaker. And this was a major icebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't get more major. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but I think it was an icebreaker for your, for um, uh, your mom as well that that happened and it brought everybody closer together here you're on the verge of you know losing um losing the ability to stay in in the u.s and uh, at the time and this comes uh, literally out of the closet and it's such a nice surprise um what was it working with uh dan and uh, how did he react to, I, I know he's an actor, but how did he react emotionally to being dressed up in drag? Dan was really, I mean, first of all, he was like incredible to work with. He's such a generous, kind uh, presence in real life and such a pro and, you know, he's like the most experienced person on our set in terms of like how much work he's done over the years for TV. And so it was just a joy to watch him work. Uh, he was very easy. Um, again, he knew exactly what I was going for. You know, we had a discussion about his character and uh, we were on the same page. He, um, you know, he was totally on board with everything. He, he When he read the script, he knew, you know, he knew what, what's in it for him and um i know um one of the things that he's done he's really good friends with judith light and so mm -hmm. he um he said he went out with this the cast and crew of transparent a couple nights and just had conversations with them about you know what that experience is is like and um as part of his sort of research for the role and yeah, he was just really game and really fun. I think the only thing that he was really intimidated by <laughs> was really cute. He was really frightened of it, actually, is karaoke singing. Okay. And uh, he's just like, I do not sing. You don't want me to sing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, it's karaoke singing. It's supposed to, you know, it doesn't really matter how horrible you are. It will, <laughs> people will believe it because there are some really horrible karaoke singers out there. <laughs> <laughs> like... Um, so he was really fun. And the girls who were in the scene with him, they just really kind of tried to <laughs> take charge and get, and uh, he really got into it. So it was, it was fun to watch. That's, that's awesome. Um, we started the film in 1985 and I got the sense that once they discovered the third channel, um, which I thought was a hilarious reference, uh, but once they discovered that, uh, they found American movies that I think signified the years in, in transition. Um, you have Working Girl, and I loved the Russian version of Let the River Run. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was amazing. 
Uh, they were talking casually about Pretty Woman. Um, yeah. <laughs> there was a reference to Total Recall. Yes. Uh, there was uh, Bloodsport uh, when he, uh, when uh, Potato first realizes what he's capable of. And uh -huh. <laughs> throwing the rag at Jesus was hilarious. <laughs> is that what I think it is? <laughs> Uh, and then um, you touch on uh, Greg Araki on the uh, once he's here in America, and uh, my hats off to you for finding the actor to play the video store clerk. Um, <laughs> there, there was just so much sexual tension, and nobody could do anything about it because Potato hadn't come out. But it, it, uh, uh, just a, a, a gem of of an actor to look at on the screen. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, the stepdad finds out that uh, Potato has rented it a hundred times. And I actually saw that film for the first time last year. I hadn't seen it. And I'm a huge uh, Greg Araki fan. Um, and I, I just I thought that that was uh, uh, it was really beautiful um, that he had found Potato had found something that he could connect with and explore his identity. Um, and, and allow the other moments in the film to happen. Did you, um, were these choices in the movies, you, you had Sister Act in there too at one point, um, were these intentional clip choices or were these true to your experience? Yeah, they were very intentional. They were all intentional and true to the experience. So I, I you know, I tried to keep it um, as close as I could to what I mean, you know, there's a variety of films that influenced us, the American films that we just loved and we would watch over and over and over again when VHS became available. Um, so I, you know, I didn't show all of them, but I picked specific ones for a reason. And there were some of the films that we were completely obsessed with. And specifically, and the the living and story is very much what you know. That was my story. Yep. And I think that's something that's something that a lot of gay people. It's funny. It's um, I feel a lot of gay people relate to uh, yeah. when they see the film that spent when if you're old enough to remember video stories, <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. You know that need to like. Oh, I know this is me, but I, I I'm not yet comfortable to go and rent it and then <laughs> eventually you do you know <laughs> and then you get the other clerk <laughs> and then you get the other clerk who wants to talk loudly <laughs> like, oh, no. right <laughs> no it, it's it's uh um uh, i hope that audiences are able to discover this because i think it's a modern day anthem for uh, being able to confront yourself and uh, being able to find a way to accept who you are and then share that with the world and share it you do in, in the last half of the movie. I mean, uh, you had Potato going at it with, <laughs> with everyone in the club and I, I, you, the, the way you cut that so quickly was awesome because you interchange um, each relation throughout the uh the encounters and then the uh was it a um uh was it a card or was it a ceramic uh religious symbol that uh potato hands to his last partner who's on his way back into the military it's a, it's like a little cardboard icon which i really had and i really gave to one of my um lovers <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> uh, I, I thought that was a really nice bookend to uh, the story because um, there was a sense that religion was, uh, well, I mean, it's not a sense, it's, it's actually prevalent, but religion is a theme throughout the movie and um, how you deal with it how your mom uh, handled it, how your grandmother handled it, and how uh, Dan Loria's character and Grace ultimately handle it. It's, it's, it's 
fits all the way through the film. Was that your common thread um, or one of your common threads? It was definitely a common thread on so many levels. And I, you know, I wonder how people would respond to it because I think it's sort of an unusual relationship to uh, religion and a gay film, especially because, you know, when I was younger um, in Soviet Union, religion, Christianity was very much on the same plane as like, you know, Madonna and Michael Jackson and capitalism and openness and freedom, you know, freedom of speech and being gay and like all of the good things of the West, basically. And so it was actually very, a very inspiring and good thing in my life at that time. And then of course I came to the States and my stepfather represented this very different side of it and it turned me against it. So I was like, you know, listening to Marilyn Manson going, <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather love Satan, you know, and then um, now, you know, now that I'm older, I'm like, I'm not, I'm definitely not religious. I don't consider myself Christian, but I also want to acknowledge that it did have this very positive, you know, and, and the importance of faith, I think for people who are really struggling um, in their life, you know, it can be sort of the saving grace and it was in our life. And I, and also relationship between a mother and son, which, you know, Mary and Jesus is sort of, uh, you know, even though, you know, you could say it's a myth or whatever, but it's still, it's a very symbolic relationship in our culture that symbolizes motherhood and, um, and the sacrifices of motherhood. And so even visually, I tried to draw on Christian um, iconography and Pietas and all of the classical paintings of uh, Christ and, um, Virgin Mary to like integrate in the film throughout so you can kind of you know I think some people will some people would notice that and some people wouldn't but it was something that I threw through the you know kind of tossed around through the film um yeah so it's definitely a very big theme and I and I wonder how people reacted because I feel like you know we're so polarized in the sense yeah. that um you know, you uh, you have this fundamentalist Christians who are the loudest and they kind of take over the conversation of what Christianity is. And then you have really sort of anti-Christian sometimes, uh, you know, beliefs on the other side. And this film is neither. <laughs> right, right. So it's, like, I it's like if either everybody hates it because it's like, it's very blasphemous to like throw a cum rug on Jesus' face. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't expect to make any friends on the <laughs> Christian right <laughs> with that, but at the same time, it's kind of it shows like a sweet, you know, a, like a a little boy's kind of sweet relationship with Jesus, where it's like he's his best friend, <laughs> even <laughs> if he's imaginary. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just it's 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 cleverly done and it's respectfully done. Um, I I felt that just like um the russian side of the movie everything is very black and white there there is no middle ground and by using that as the basis for religion or perhaps better stated theology theological and and spiritual journeys and enlightenments you don't um, the movie doesn't fall on one side or the other. It, it actually straddles both sides of uh, ideology. And uh, it, it's, it's a very strong point in the movie. And uh, I, 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 once again, I have to congratulate you because your subject, your subject matter is, uh, is mixed into uh, a, as you said, a uh, 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 spiritual thinking that is all over the spectrum. And, um, you know, it gives me comfort that a movie can talk to us and say, I might be gay, but I don't have to choose one religion or another. There is a freedom mm -hmm. of that choice. And that's a very powerful statement. Thank you. Absolutely. What, uh, uh actually, before I get to that, um, the movie was at South by Southwest this year, correct? Uh, That's when we opened, yeah. Okay. How did that go? 
You know, it was one, I mean, it's always such an honor to premiere at South by Southwest and I, I love them. It, it was different this year because it was virtual. So, you know, it was kind of bittersweet in a way because I, I have heard from a lot of people who, who are like, I have never been able to go because it's so expensive, but this year I'm going to watch. So that part was really great because a lot of people who, you know, who can't afford to go to South by were able to participate. But at the same time, as a filmmaker, of course, it's like it, you need your live screening. So, but you know, they did all they could. You know, they couldn't do any more in the circumstances that they are. So, I, I, I'm really grateful that they included the film and they did such a good job with their, you know, uh, streaming program and the app. And so, but you know, it was a new experience. I can't. But I, I feel bad complaining because everybody's in the same boat, right? Right. <laughs> It's not like for me. It's really like everybody's having to deal with it. No, it, it it I've I've talked to other filmmakers who are in the same boat, and uh, they have similar sentiments. Um, and uh, as as a film critic and as an audience member, I try to separate both. Um, I appreciate the fact that more eyes get to see your film because of virtual screenings and. Uh, you might not get that instant audience reaction. I, I think that's where a social media campaign comes in, um, getting the message of your movie out there, uh, opportunities like this to, to be able to present at an LGBTQ film festival always help. Um, and so uh, uh, that, that audience is probably a lot more broad than if you'd been able to screen in a theater. Um, you yeah. might, like I said, you might not get that instant reaction, uh, but uh, it's definitely out there. And uh, from, from me, it's appreciated. I'm glad. Yeah, no, that's good to hear. Absolutely. What's next for you? Um, I'm writing a, a new script that's based on um, a series of memoirs from a friend of mine. And um, it's set in the 80s and 90s, uh, again, in Seattle. It's a very Seattle story, sort of relating to the whole grudge thing. And it's a very shocking, very gay, um, I would say tragic comedy thriller. <laughs> awesome. And um, makes my life story seem very tame. In <laughs> 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 Which is when I, you know, when I had a conversation with my friend about his life, I was like, okay, this is definitely <laughs> <laughs> my next project. This is what I want to do. Pardon the pun, but this is small potatoes compared to your next project, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And I'd love, I have a series called Capitol Hill that's, um, it, it started out as a Huffington Post series and then it ended up being on TV, like in Europe and in Canada. And I would love to do a third season. It's a gay horror telenovela. Very cool. With a lot of drag queens playing the lead roles. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I, I again, I, I admire your creativity. I admire your passion. Um, I admire your intellect. Uh, you know, it, it takes real courage to tell a true to life story, a biopic, if you will. And uh, it, it's on the screen for everybody to see. And I can't thank you enough for your time this afternoon. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, uh, sorry. Um, no, I th thank you again. Um, my name is Ben Calamer. Uh, I've been speaking with Wes Hurley about his film, uh, Potato Dreams of America, and uh, it is uh, available on the Desperado streaming platform. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this uh, presentation and we look forward to sharing more director stories uh, with you in the coming days. Thank you, Ben. Absolutely. Thank you, Wes. Thank you.